Today on Star Talk Special Edition, we learn about a hopeful new direction of cancer treatments and how they work. Could we one day rid humanity of this terrible multifaceted disease that masquerades as our own selves as we try to rid them from our universe? Up next on Star Talk. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, serving as your host. Today, it's special edition. And I got with me my special edition co host, Gary O'Reilly. Gary. Hi, Neil. Yeah, former soccer pro and mm-hmm. sports commentator. I also got Chuck. Nice, Chuck. Always good to have you, man. Hey, Neil. So today, we're taking up the top, very serious topic the emperor of all maladies, cancer. Oh my gosh. Gary, what did you put together for today? Uh, Well, finding a successful treatment for cancer has long been one of medical science's biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge. So, you know, with variable results and some rather nasty side effects, but there was one particular cancer researcher at City of Hope Cancer Research and Treatment Center in Los Angeles decided, as she says, follow the science. And now we are looking at the possibility of a treatment that takes out the cancerous tumor, but leaves the healthy cells around it intact. I mean, this, yeah, wow. This is the kind of science that really could change people's lives. And by the way, our guest once dreamed of being an astronaut. So, uh, yes, if you would like to introduce our guest, I think we're going to have an interesting show. Okay. I'll introduce anyone who ever dreamed of becoming an astronaut. Uh, Linda Malkus. PhD. Linda, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you so much. I'm such an honor to be here. You're Associate Chair and Professor in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the City of Hope Cancer Research and Treatment Center. So I'm just glad places like that exist in this world. And uh, you have clinical expertise in molecular diagnostics and experimental therapeutics. So it sounds like you're all up in this. Uh, And so just welcome. And so tell us about cancer. Like what Mm. all all I I, I have basic understanding of cancer. What, what, Chuck? What do you I was going to say, that sounds like the worst bedtime story request ever. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about about cancer. cancer? (laughs) (laughs) So, so cancer is hard to treat as I understand it because the, the cells look just like your cells. So anything would, that would kill a cancer cell is going to kill your cell. And that's the beginning and end of what I know about cancer, basically. So what, what can you add to that? And what can you tell us about the new treatment? Well, actually, you got a really good start with this in that the that cancer, cancer, I guess, you know, in, in my opinion, is uh, really kind of a way the body turning on itself. And cancer is like, uh, you know, being that I, you already know, I'm a, you know, like a science fiction geek. So alien, you know, if you think of the movie Aliens, you know, you can think of cancer as, you know, the most perfect predator. You know, it, it really is. It, and it's why it's so hard to treat because it looks like us. It's our own body. It knows all our own tricks, you know, how, you know, it's our processes which it uses against us. And then cancer also has this ability uh, to constantly evolve. It's actually a very scary predator. It really is. And that's why it's so very, very hard to treat because it's constantly changing itself. It, it is such a weird entity. Uh, that's how I, you know, when I used to, when I was first studying, you know, I would really look at it as like a you know, it's a cell, you know, but it's almost like a living entity. It, it is, you know, if you think about it every day, and I want to c- congratulate you all, you're all cancer survivors, every one of us, including myself, every day since before we were born, we make at least eight cancer cells and our immune systems take them out. So we're wow. constantly making that. It's, we're with it's, eight it's, cells per, per day. Every per day. day. Okay. <laughs> per day. Okay. Okay. Per day. day. Okay. Per day. Okay. We're so we're cancer. making at least eight cancer cells every day. And mm-hmm. uh, your immune system is constantly surveilling and taking them out. We also have these other wonderful processes in our cells. We are constantly making DNA damage. Just the act of eating 
and and metabolizing food, you're actually making, you know, uh, free radicals, which are attached, you know, attacking your DNA. And we have these wonderful DNA repair systems uh, that go in and just clean it all up and, you know, the cells divide and, and you know, and we, we're rather a miracle that that we fun- that we were here and there are not giant tumors as it is, but cancer cells. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's, it's, it's true. true. It's, true. <laughs> it's a miracle that we are ourselves and not just tumors walking around. I'm telling you, tumors with eyes. You know, so um, <laughs> that's uh, a sci-fi story. Yeah, right yeah. There. yeah. I, was, I just scared myself. So yeah. uh, you know, you you have these cancer. You know, so you have cells. These you know, they become cancer cells, you know, they're, they're started by DNA damage. Okay. Or a mutation. I mean, that's the heart of what cancer is a change to your genome, change to your, your DNA. But what happens with cancer cells is they go on to make DNA, their DNA damage to themselves. They continue. It's called uh, uh, constitutive replication stress. They are continually damaging their, themselves. And you think about that, you go, why would a cell continue to make damage? It doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, why are you continually mutating your own genome? But that is a, um, the way I look at it and others is actually it's an, uh, almost an evolutionary mechanism for them. Like I said, you know, every day we're making a cancer cells. We have this incredible immune system that's constantly surveilling and, you know, taking them out. So for a cancer cell to survive, it needs to constantly change itself so that it can avoid the surveillance system. It sounds so, eerily like a virus, the way that, yeah. that you explain it. You it's, know, it's diabolical. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the viruses because, you know, there is been thinking for a long time, uh, you know, that ways to even treat some forms or cancer could, you know, could we use things that, you know, we use to target viruses, could we use yeah. them for cancer? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing. I don't want to scare your audience, but... <laughs> You but already have. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so good things. So you know, practice good health. You know, things that mm. that you know. No, uh, I can't get walking tumors with eyes out of my yeah, mouth. Yeah. Because exactly. of that. So so what is what is what is this treatment uh, that has 1996 in the title? What what is this? Okay, so so it starts a long time ago. I never planned on being a cancer researcher. Well, I was going to be a space scientist, but, it, but I got really, I fell in love with the molecule of DNA. So my very early work had to do with, if you look inside the human cell, there's a nucleus, right? And inside the nu- human, you know, I always call the nucleus like the house of DNA. Okay. So in the house of DNA, you know, the human cell harbors three feet of DNA inside the nucleus of every cell. Uh, if, you I, it, if you uncoiled it, if you uncoiled it, uncoiled it all feet. out and stretched okay. it out linear, mm-hmm. three feet of DNA mm-hmm. is shoved into something we can't even see. Right. right. Wow. And, you know, if you took all the DNA of every cell and tied it end to end, that the person will die. <laughs> well, probably, but also if you took all the DNA out of one human and stretched it out into space, it goes beyond the sun. Wow. Oh, Just okay. from one human? Wow. Yeah, that's how well, much that genetic information we harbor. Yes, that's how much mm-hmm. genetic information we harbor. Amazing. We are amazing machines. And, and the person dies in that case, too. Yes. 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 Well, yeah, especially if you get close to the sun. So, yeah. so, so when a, you know, every day, every, you know, so our gut, you know, we're like a tube within a tube. So your gut turns over like every two to three days, you know, so there's a lot of cell division that goes on in your gut. And every time uh, you, your gut cells have, or any cell in the, in the human body has to divide, what you do is uh, the mother cell has to make a whole new complement. So that's another three feet of DNA stuffed inside of one nucleus. And then it's to those two cells in the DNA are, are divided out. 
So I got really interested how how does a human cell replicate its DNA in such a confined space and inside of like eight hours, it makes that. There isn't a human machine that we have invented that can actually do anything near this with such incredible fidelity. So um, I got very interested. And so I, I, um, I got uh, involved in studying DNA replication complexes. And then, you know, as an independent investigator, I started reading about cancer and cancer, you know, is a, a disease of DNA damage. That's really what cancer the, is. The crime scene of replication. Yeah. And, and mm. here, here, like yeah, Agatha Christie, here she goes. So I go and, um, and I said, you know, I'm like the mother of replication complexes. I can make, I literally can isolate from a human cell, a replication complex, put it into a test tube offer it DNA and it would make DNA just like, you know, inside the cell. So I said, gee, I wonder if this complex is different in cancer cells versus normal cells. And I won't go into the gory details, but the bottom line was, yes, it was different in cancer cells. Cancer cells corrupt the DNA replication apparatus so that it allows a sprinkling of DNA damage every time it Makes it, so so actually you can almost think of the daughter cells of a mother cancer cells are different from its own mother. That's how 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 it changes. So I so I found that, and then we started looking since I knew a lot of the proteins that were inside of this replication machine. I started looking through who was different. And we found one protein, which I didn't think would it be the protein. I thought it was going to be one of the cool DNA polymerases, you know, but it wasn't. It was a protein called proliferating cell nuclear antigen or PCNA. Now, way back when, when we first found this altered form of PCNA, um, you know, people would never have looked at it. They always think it was like this. So it's, a, it's called a sliding clamp protein. And I liken it. Okay, like if you think of DNA as like a shower curtain rod, PCNA is kind of like your shower curtain ring. So, so PCNA is a sliding clamp protein and it circles DNA. And what it does, it, it, it tethers three other molecules that have to work at DNA and allows them to process and do whatever it is that they have to do. Now, the cool thing about PCNA, PCNA, okay, interacts with at least 200 other proteins in the human cell. It has by protein-protein interactions. So we found that PCNA was different in cancer cells compared to normal cells, and that that difference in PCNA correlated now with this funky replication act, right? So I got thinking, I said, hmm, Suppose we make, I mean, you know, technically we found a, a new molecular target, this PCNA that's different in cancer cells. And it's not changed in the genome. It's not changed because of RNA. If I was to develop a drug to that PCNA, to the form that's only in the cancer cell and not in the normal cell, several things come from this. One, I would, I would target and knock out only the cancer cell, because that drug would only be effective inside the cancer cell to kill the cancer cell. But it would also be super effective because it's not just attacking one protein, it's taking out an entire network of 200 protein functions inside of the cancer cell while leaving that same network in place in a normal cell. Hmm. That is the heart of what AOH 1996 is. It is a molecule. So this, was, this was a race to find something different about the cancer cell. Yeah. This that totally had people. It totally is. It's it's uh, it has mm -hmm. so many novel features to it. I'll be very honest. When we first found it, you know, on, you know, everybody wonders how come it takes so long to do you know cancer research? Why can't they do these things fast? Well. 
we had a, a, a you know, this was found. Is that out. what we sound like to you? Is that what yeah, they that's, that's a great. I, I, I'm, a lot of flying. I'm on a lot of airplanes and I'll sit next to people on airplanes. This has to happen to you too, but I'll sit on airplanes and I'll tell people when I, you know, hey, I'm a cancer researcher. I get a couple of different things. One is, you know, they already have the cure for cancer. They're just holding it back. You know? Oh, God. Oh, really? <laughs> Gotta love what I, those that, people. That's what I get. Yeah. And then so, the you other know, they one make is so what? much money off of treating cancer. They yeah. can't cure it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, and then can the you other imagine one how I much money they would make off of a cure? <laughs> That's mm-hmm. what I always say. I said, like, you know, like, and what, then the you other one me? I always get. So then the other thing I get is, um, uh, uh, you know, why does it take so long? Because, you know, finding a target, moving it forward, you know, and the, this target was so different. I actually went to a very large pharma company uh, way back when. So this is a, when I first found it. And I say, hey, I found this great molecular target. Can you help me make a drug to it? And they, uh, they said it was undruggable, that there was mm. no why, way. Why was PCNA undruggable then? What was it about that particular okay. protein that this, at the, made it? It's changing. There's dogma. Okay, ah. there's some dogma in the field. And dogma was you only t- uh, uh, make a drug against an enzyme. Gotcha. Uh, mm. And so it was quite crushing to me when I went to this very large pharma company and I danced for them. You know, I took all I took about replication complex. I was dancing for them and saying, this is a great target. And they very kind. They were listening to me and they said, undruggable. You'll never be able to make a drug to this. It's it's involved in protein-protein interactions. It's an disordered protein region. It's impossible. And I just, you know, when I left that place, you know, I said, oh my God, how could I have been such a, how could I have been so, you know, but by the time I made the parking lot of that place, I was like, I'll be damned. I'm going to, I'm going to try to figure this out. And with great force. Wait, wait, don't tell me you found a solution just to spite somebody. No, <laughs> no, no. Actually, I I did it. No. Whatever no, the actually, motivation is, I guess. No, no. I made a promise to a family that I was going to go and try to do something. Okay. About cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's right. an underlying heart issue here. Okay. I, I got to tell you. There's a noble gotta, cause. Gotta there is the a truth, very Dave. noble cause. Yes. Spite, to, spite sells better, though. Well, no, because, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess Spike would, but that's, you know. Let me just Spike, tell you something. It, when, when we make the movie, when we make the Linda Malkus movie about, you know, the, 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 the treatment and the, the, the cure of these certain types of cancers, um, the Spike angle is what we're going to go with. <laughs> like the you family, know, the family will, you know, the family will be great. the motivation. You know, but the sp- Spike is great fuel. Yeah. But mm. it won't hold you for long term. That's a very good point. Agreed. That, that, that really is a really good point. It, it, you know, it's, it really yeah. you can only go so far because you you know you just run out of fuel. Yeah, that's but a good point. But when it's a heart issue and it's right. a promise, that's something else. I'm going to dub you the queen of different thinking just for the moment. Was there other different thinking that had to follow your initial thought process that obviously was different to everyone else's? that led you to AOH 1996 and its efficacy. So you think about how this drug is working. It is very different. Okay. It wasn't an enzyme targeting an enzyme. I, do, I speak a lot in analogy. One of the ways that you shut down most of the air traffic in the United States is you send a snowstorm into O'Hare and you shut down all those routes. Okay. So PCNA <laughs> is a terminal. That's okay. It's fantastic. a hub. It's an, Okay. And you're shutting down 200 flights out. So literally, what I'm trying to do is build a snowstorm to take out a central hub. That's going back to this sliding clamp that you talk about, these these proteins all yeah. being connected. And mm. so you, what you're doing is you're coming in and you're saying, I'm not going to treat this. What, what I'm going to do is shut down the system inside of the system. Shut down the whole network. Right. Shut down the whole the whole thing. So that was really different. As luck would have it, this place called City of Hope called me 
out of the blue and asked me if I would be an external advisor for them to come in and review their research program. And so when I went there, I had I was blown away because they had put together this incredible apparatus, which I hadn't seen inside of an academic institution before, where they had put together all the people, the resources, and the facilities for actually taking an idea off a lab bench and moving it to the clinic. And I was like, this is where I got to go. So I moved to City of Hope, and they're wonderful. I've got with all these, these great minds, right? But I still had to do a lot of molecular biology, even to get them to be able to work on what I needed to do. And what I had to do was figure out where on the PCNA molecule was the business part for the cancer. And so what I did was I made it, I got the PCNA gene out, you know, and we made mutations through PCNA. And we made antibodies, and all kinds of things. And we were actually able to define a small domain of about 10 amino acids, which was the difference between cancer and normal. Once I had that address on the protein, so you know, every protein is so beautiful. Each one has its own crystal structure. You know, if you look at the crystal structures, they're, they're like their own, every protein's like its own fingerprint. So I found on this big protein, this little bitty address, but it had that address had made a formed a pocket inside of the molecule. And uh, once I had that pocket, that's when I could start screening for molecules. And we screened through 6.5 million molecules that would sit. Are these inside are humans the or is it some form of AI doing this? Mm. It's a form of AI. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you use these gigantic, so this, this is so cool. I mean, this is called virtual screening. So they have, you know, these fantastic computers, you know, with, uh, you know, these databases of, of molecules just, and they're like from everything from trees and mushrooms and, you know, from everything, any kind of structure of, so the 6.5 million molecules. And you take your protein, that, that 3D form of your protein, and I got that little packet sitting inside that protein. And you take that structure and that little pocket and you stick it in the computer. And the computer goes 6.5 million times this way. Right, to see you what know, puzzles looking for together. Those mm. Right. Right. And it came up oh, with 53. Cool. 53 out of 6.5 million. And uh, we took them home and we tested 53 compounds on normal versus cancer cells. And of the 53 compounds, we found five that killed the cancer cells and left the normal cells alone. Wow. And it was like, oh my God, but that doesn't mean anything. It's on a lab bench. And the work has been duplicated? Yeah. So then it becomes this incredible process of, you know, having that in what they call it a hit. So of those five molecules, we picked one. Mm -hmm. um, very unique structure. Nothing looked like it chemically. And we moved it slowly forward through the process. So um, and it became AOH 1996. It's in clinical trial now. It's in a phase one trial. It's phase, phase one with humans. So in what, humans. what phases with 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 mm. other animals? Okay, so is that, is that one of the phases? Yeah. So the workup to get to the FDA, you have to do testing in animals. Uh, we did it in mice and dogs. Um, and the beautiful part of it, of all those that testing was. It did not show toxicity. We never found the maximum tolerated dose. The animals are very happy on it. I mean, mm. you know, they're, they're, mm. they show no, they eat. Uh, they show no neurological problems. Um, and in tumor models, you know, animal tumor models, we show that we could inhibit uh, tumor growth. And with all that data, you go to the FDA 
And then they granted permission now for the phase one trial. So we have patients that have been enrolled in the phase one trial. Uh, And the phase one trial, so there's three levels of trialing uh, to move something to that, you know, it can be used in the clinic. Phase one is a toxicity trial. You know, how, what, can we find the maximum tolerated dose in humans? And my, I have a strong suspicion we won't. Um, and then you go on to now efficacy trials. Those are called phase two trials where, you know, you're testing, you know, do you see any effect in, on, on a, a person with tumor? And then phase three are these large trials, you know, over different populations. You describe um, cancer as a molecular signature disease. Um, I can say that, but I'm not quite sure I'm anywhere near qualified to explain what that means. So would you, in in terms that I might understand, what that actually means? Because you don't see it as singular. You see it as multiple diseases, don't you? Yeah. So when I was learning, you know, I was training, cancer was really thought as like one thing. You know, you had breast cancer, you had lung cancer, you had prostate cancer, you had, you know, you whatever can it was one type, right? And I used to work with a a, a wonderful a breast cancer oncologist out in Indiana and um, he said it used to, it would drive him crazy. He said, "Linda, I'd have two women who come in with breast cancer in my practice." And everything about them is the same. You know, they, they grew up on the same street. They have, you know, they have the same number of children. Everything I could measure about them was the same. He said, I would put them on protocol and one would respond beautifully and one would die. And there was no way to tell the difference. That was our thinking for so long that you know, cancer was one thing that has totally been radically changed now. Because cancer is probably as in- individual as your fingerprint. Well, cancer as okay. it affects the individual. Yeah. Yes. So you think about your tumor now. Your no. tumor has its molecular signature. You know, the thing that's that. You know, there's a lot of unique features. That's why you know this molecular signature part of cancer is such a, 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 a huge breakthrough. You know, yeah. we're, they call it precision medicine now right. or moving towards precision medicine. Hmm. Is that, that the same thing as, as designer medicine? You're getting there. Seriously, you're getting there. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. if you, and, and if you can think the two, like we, the other thing with, that we had very myopic vision was that tumor was all by itself. But you also have to recognize that the tumor is sitting inside of a host. So there's a, the environment around the tumor is going to influence cancer activity just as much as the tumor itself. So if I'm not serving and, dinner at home, I don't like being called a host. There's something about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm yeah, cool with it as long as there's as long as there's not a parasite involved. I'm all right yeah. with it. Well, you know, that's what you, says you, my you, whole you, point. Uh, I'll tell you, cancer is a parasite. It just yeah. hasn't figured out yeah. how not to kill the host. It is a right. parasite. Right. I mean, cancer mm-hmm. is a parasite. So now a person comes in to clinic, you have their genome read, and you can actually right. figure out we're moving to this. We already yeah. do it in some cancers. Mm. But you look at their molecular signature and you're starting to say, oh, well, you know, this drug works better in this place. And, you know, even if the drug drug was found in lung cancer, but a woman could come into the clinic with breast cancer with the molecular signature of that of the tumor that would really work well with a lung drug. I mean, wow. it's really yeah. amazing. We are really in a very, very different kind of time and a, a revolution in time in thinking. But, wow. wait, wait, so what, what is the evidence that one kind of cancer migrated from one organ to another? Okay, though well, that's because uh, ma- many women with breast cancer die yeah. of brain no, cancer. No, I don't. I don't right? want you to get confused. I don't want you to get confused. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, so yeah, so there's actually me, two things going on. One is metastasis. You know where. You know, mm-hmm. like a, a woman has a breast cancer, 
and they will likely metastasize to bone or brain. I mean, it's kind of like it has a homing device. It will go there. It likes that environment, you know. The other thing, what I was, but I want to stress is the molecular mis- signature is not a, about metastasis. Sometimes the things that are helpful to a tumor to grow, whether it's breast or lung, are the switching on or off of particular genes. That so that is a molecular signature that could help us potentially either use current therapies or make new therapies for. That's a that's a you know base molecular signature. Metastasis is a whole nother animal. So you said that we produce eight cancer cells per day. How does this treatment differ in our body's uh, eradication of those eight cells? And why don't we just try to replicate what the body, so you have this antigen, is is our body making an antibody that actually just uh, kills these eight cells? Exactly how is the body killing the eight cells? And why aren't we trying to replicate that? So it's good that you bring these things up. So that, you know, one of the big arms or areas of research that is going on is immunotherapy, right? It's like harnessing the power of the immune system. And so you have, you know, uh, they call them CAR T cell therapy. There are immune checkpoint therapies. Huge. This is a a, a amazing question. Obviously, in a fully functional person, our immune system is keeping things in where they keeping cancer in balance. You know, you're in check. You're keeping it in check. Whatever reason, you know, we become out of balance. You know, or you're exposed to some environmental cause. Body doesn't maintain that balance anymore. So there are wonderful arms of research, some it's going on at City of Hope, very, very exciting, where they are exploiting now or trying to understand how to better harness the immune system. But you know, the thing is, but I have to go back, cancer constantly is figuring its way around things that we throw at it. You know, way back when, when I was training, everybody said, you know, we're going to find the cancer gene, the cancer gene. It turns out there's lots of cancer gene. I do not believe we will ever have a single therapy. What we will have is, and I believe AOH 1996 is going to serve as one of the agents in an arsenal. We already have an arsenal. But the object is with using precision medicine that we are able to turn cancer from a critical disease into now a managed disease. And we're moving towards that. I actually have a friend who had breast cancer and she never went into remission. She would live for 12 years with cancer. That's that's kind of like prostate cancer. Most men, most men die with prostate cancer because it's so, it's such a slow growing cancer that sometimes it's like, well, we keep an eye on it. You know, there's no need to do anything invasive uh, because you'll be dead before it kills you. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very painful cancer for men. It oh, really is. Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> I know, actually, in some, you know, if it, you know, if it progresses for them, yeah. May I ask you, AOH 1996 is administered as a pill. Yes, um, twice a day. Why, why, a, why a pill? So why, why a pill? Hmm. Uh, I wanted to make it easier on the patient, you know, as opposed to them having to be hooked up to infusion, but also based on the, uh, the chemistry of the drug, it has a half-life of about five hours. And oh. so in order to keep the drug present all the time, it needs to be administered twice a day. So it didn't, you know, patient isn't going to come in and be hooked up to an infusion, you know, all the time. 
Hmm. So, uh, so it's a continued, you know, the patient comes in, uh, they are, you know, our phase one patients come in, they are, you know, checked for, you know, certain how they're doing and everything. And then, uh, they're given their pills and they, they go home and they, they take it. And so they take it twice a day. Hmm. So Linda, I heard you use the term half-life. Is that in the way we would use that term in physics? Uh, yeah. Where yeah. after a certain amount of time, there's half of the thing that matters that's still active uh, going yes, on? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So the body, you know, it, the drug is metabolized, you know, eventually. It, oh, metabolized. So that's what eats yeah, it up. Yeah, so yeah. So it has after, a half-life metabolism. Yeah. Oh, so cool. after, after five hours, there's half of the drug and after and another five hours uh, half, half of, the of half. what that was right half of the half and so then you got to pick it back up with another dose right right so i get it okay yeah that's like okay. you know like anybody taking antibiotics you know you t- some right. people say have to take it three times a day or right. twice a day it has to do with maintaining a drug and the- i know I, I understand it precisely with that terminology yeah. but i've never seen the term half-life on a bottle of drugs. <laughs> they should put it on there. And oh, you so know the what? Behind the label. Yeah, they should put yeah, it on the, there because okay. it's so important. Like when you said antibiotics, a lot of people screw up their antibiotics because they're not taking them when they're supposed to take them or they don't finish them. And it's so important that you do that because of that reason. So maybe they have life that might give them a, make it a little more urgent. It might them. make it right. more urgent if you said actually like, the, you, you know, know that's actually the you know for any drugs, you know, if they say, you know, take it every eight hours, it all has to do with the drug half-life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. good thing to I, know. I will henceforth think of it in those terms. Yeah. 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 Because that That's is the half life of my aspirin, right? right. Or, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you need like I'll yeah. tell you the half I'll tell you the half life of aspirin children. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> you said AOH nineteen ninety six would most likely be most effective as a combination therapy. Is that going to be beneficial for cancer resistance as opposed to like a single pathway therapy? That's actually a wonderful question, Gary. Thank Thank you. you. So one of the problems with cancer, it's a pain in the butt. Remember, it's this evolutionary thing going on with cancer. So a woman has ovarian cancer or a person has lung cancer. And they are treated with a, usually with a platinum compound, uh, right off. Um, and what, what's a platinum compound? So they're, yeah. they're platinum, they're, they're chemotherapeutics that, uh, attack, um, uh, you yeah, know, attacks DNA. So mm-hmm. and it's also very toxic because it can't tell the difference between a normal and malignant cell. So it's targeting proliferating cells, which are cancer cells, but you also have a lot of proliferating cells mm. that are healthy, yeah. that are healthy. Right. And that's why so many chemotherapeutics are horrible because they're targeting poli- proliferating cells and they can't differentiate it between normal and malignant. So for example, yep. as we came to understand it, um, your hair grows faster than most other things in your body. So that right. would be a byproduct of the targeting of proliferating cells. Is that correct? Yeah. So mm. your eyebrows, your toenails right. come off. Right. Ooh. These are horrible. Mm, These yeah. side effects are horrible. Mm. You know, you, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, you lose your eyelashes, you know, your tongue, you know, um, your gut. Remember I told you your gut is turning right. over, turning over two or two, three days rapidly. That's why so many chemotherapeutics really are, have such bad GI effects. But going back to Gary's question about combination therapies and resistance, well, one with AOH 1996, you know, if it holds up for being very non-toxic and effective for treating cancer, of course, you can now, what you do is you, and not just AOH 1996, this happens all the time. The thinking now is we're not going it makes big pharma unhappy because they always want one big drug, you know, that's Mm. going to treat everybody. But now that the one big drug, or they call it monotherapy, we're moving away from monotherapy and more going towards what they call cocktails. Okay. Is that you will put together 
a variety of drugs, you know, like treating testis cancer. Chuck knows a lot about cocktails. In Chuck knows. I knew that. I knew that gag was coming. That was, yes. <laughs> yeah. So my joke is okay. that AOH 1996 will be the olive in everyone's cocktail. Ooh. So oh, like oh, that. Look at that. So, um, so two things with AOH 1996. Great hope down the line if it proves to maintain its non-toxicity. Um, I hope that we've already done studies in animals to show that it complements a variety of currently used drugs. And in the presence of our drug, we can actually lower the amount of some of these very toxic drugs very significantly. Right. So the animals can have, you know, they can still show very effective growth inhibition of the tumor, but they're not sick. But your thing about resistance, this has come up a lot for me for this drug, for AOH 1996. My lab has worked really hard at trying to make resistant cancer cells. Cancer cells love to do this. Yeah. I mean, like I was talking about the patient, you know, the lung cancer, ovarian cancer patient, they respond beautifully, but in a year or two, their cancer comes back. Right. And they're resistant now to like cisplatin or mm -hmm. carboplatin. AOH 1996, we can't make a resistant cell so far. And I'm thinking why? If I, like a lot of the therapies that are made against kinases, single enzymes, remember they do one function and what the cancer cell can do, because it's such a little, you know, it goes, you know, so you're treating, you know, like with a kinase inhibitor, you know, does a cancer cells will now change the enzyme that that used to target, okay, that that drug would target. So now it's resistant to the drug. Right. Um, and cancer figures a lot of different ways to become resistant to drugs. This is amazing. That's, yeah, it's, 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 cancer is like, a, it's an it's, amazing. It's unbelievable. Is, is there such a thing as cell intelligence? I'm trying to figure out, because as I hear you talk about this, and I'm thinking about viruses, and uh, it, these cells that, that tend to adapt and change and, you know, reconfigure, it's like, what is going on that this can happen? Is that just part of our evolutionary process? What What is going on? It wants to survive. Don't take a stab at that. Go ahead. There's billions of them. Yes, oh. exactly. Oh. Billions oh. and billions. So, <laughs> yes. So, so most will die right. because they can't adapt to the thing. The they, few that do, do bada bing. Hey, there you go. That makes bada perfect bing. sense. Look at bada that. Bing. So Linda, I just spoke up out of turn. No, you did great. Right? No, you did great. You're there here. you go. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. <laughs> well, just, so Chuck, when it's a game of numbers, there's always somebody who's going to slip through the gate. Mm -hmm. through the, yep. Look at that. Yeah. And wow. and remember, and it's constantly changing its genome. It's like locks. You know, it's changing the locks. Right. right so right, with right. the with mm -hmm. resistance now, what I'm thinking with our drug, it's not a single enzyme. It's a herb. You'd have to change all those gates, right. you know, all those mm -hmm. proteins coming in and going out. So I have this, I have to write a paper on it. I have a, I'm going to, for the first time ever, and I probably shouldn't do it, but I have the hubba hubba hypothesis <laughs> for treating kids. Love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hubba hubba. Mm -hmm. So by attacking a hub like PCNA, because it controls, uh, you know, all these, this network. If we could identify other networks like PCNA and start targeting hubba hubba, right? You really would be shutting down cancer cells. Of course, you have to find them very cancer specific, but uh, as opposed to the, the very long time strategy of just so targeting a single enzyme, as opposed to start targeting a single star, you just do a whole galaxy. You know. You target galaxies, mm -hmm. hubba hubba. So Linda, just so take us out here. In five years, 10 years, what does the world look like? Things have changed so much in the cancer therapy field just in 10 years. You know, from my training in the last millennium, 
okay, last <laughs> century, you know, where we thought, oh, yes. we're going to find one cancer gene, one drug, one drug's going to do it all. You know, we were so naive to now the basic understanding that everyone's tumor is different. But now with using molecular signatures, we're getting every tumor's address. We're figuring out where they live. Okay, not just local. Mm. I, know live. I, I know where you live. There you go. I know where you live, cancer. I know where you live. That's exactly what we're being <laughs> able to do. Chuck is <laughs> getting Philadelphia on you right oh, there. Yeah. Right. yeah. Come right. see me. Well, Philly. you don't have to come see me. I'll come see you. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. But you know, the thing is, is with figuring out the underlying molecular signature of each tumor, person's tumors, their personalized signature of that tumor. And now coupling it with, with this molecular signature, you respond to these subset of therapies. So when a lady comes in with breast cancer, you can say, Mrs. Doe, you have breast cancer 6A. And we know that 6A responds to this cohort of drugs and will effectively treat her. Wow. And she may okay. be cured. And if she comes and if she comes out of remission, we check that signature again and we say, wow, we use this cohort of drugs. So I see, I see great things. I We're going, see great you're, you're going from carpet bombing to precision targeting. Yeah. It's amazing. Do drone strikes, baby. It's drone, drone strikes. Mm. Drone strikes. Um, it's, from it's, like, it's like walking, Chuck, strikes. it's like walking into a store, buying a suit off the peg or going to Savile Row bespoke. where the best tailors in the world are. I love get it. Bespoke. Exactly. Bespoke. Just for you. There, there you, you go. go. That's fantastic. Mm. Bespoke drugs. All right. Hey, Linda, you said you're from Queens, New York? Is that you're in yeah, LA now? Yeah, that's the but night's you, flushing. Queens? Yes, yeah. yes. Cancer never, stood, cancer never stood a chance. She's from Queens, New uh, York. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what high school did you go to? Uh, so, yeah, so high school, I went to St. Agnes in uh, College Point. St. Agnes, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then All for right. school, I'm a graduate of City University of New York, Queens College. Wow. See, cute that. CUNY. All right. Well, Linda, thank you for being on the show. Oh, my well, gosh. Thank you. We like intermittent beacons of hope which you have offered us all hmm. uh, as we proceed here. And, you know, we, this uh, special edition, Star Talk, is all about uh, many things, uh, just, but the human condition especially. And uh, you're at the center of that for so many people out there. So thanks for sharing your expertise. And keep at it. Thank Stop you. Stop talking to us. Get back, get back to the lab. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 <laughs> they're in there. Okay. They're in there working. Trust they're, me. They're, mm. All right. Gary, always good to have you, Gary. Pleasure. So glad we had a chance to tell this story. Yes. All right, Chuck. Good always to have you there. Always a pleasure. Neil deGrasse Tyson for another edition of Star Talk Special Edition. As always, as Linda taught us once again, keep looking up. <laughs>